Hi, I'm Kevin Freeman. I'm the author of the book Secret Weapon, and I have the opportunity to share with you a little today about some of the research that took place in my book and some of the background. This is a briefing, as I've given in Washington numerous times to congressmen, to uh, members of the intelligence community, to members of the defense community, and to economists. So I appreciate you taking time with us. First thing I'd like to introduce you to, you may remember, you may have seen this on uh, C-SPAN, but this is Representative Paul Kanjorski, and here's what he had to say in reference to the 2008 market collapse. On Thursday at about 11 o'clock in the morning, the Federal Reserve noticed a tremendous drawdown of uh, 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 money market accounts in the United States to the tune of $550 billion was being dr drawn out in a matter of an hour or two. The Treasury opened up its uh, 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 window to help. They pumped $105 billion in the system and quickly realized that they could not stem the tide. We were having an electronic run on the banks. They decided to close the operation, close down the money accounts, and announce a guarantee of $250,000 per account so there wouldn't be further panic out there. And that's what actually happened. If they had not done that, th their estimation was that by 2 o'clock that afternoon, $5.5 trillion would have been drawn out of the money market system of the United States, would have collapsed the entire economy of the United States, and within 24 hours, the world economy would have collapsed. Now, we talked at that time about what would happen if that happened. It would have been the end of our economic system and our political system as we know it. And that's why, when they made the point, we've got to act and do things quickly, we did. That was an unbelievable moment in American history where we lost something like $50 trillion worth of wealth globally and about $15 trillion in the United States. And in fact, recent studies have shown that the average American net worth has dropped 40% because of that market crash. We're back to levels of the 1990s in wealth. How did we get here? Well. In the book, Secret Weapon, I talk about a three-phased economic attack. Phase one was the price of oil ramping up, and it went up substantially from about, in 2007, January, $50 a barrel to approximately $150 a barrel by June 2008. It's the fastest ramp up of oil prices in history without a supply disruption. Phase two was the stock market crash. Well, phase one, we had the oil price run up. That actually made OPEC oil and gas in the ground, the value of it, worth roughly the equivalent of the entire world financial system. That's just amazing, almost $140 trillion in the value of OPEC oil and gas in the ground. Phase two, I mentioned, was the stock market crash, and that's what Representative Kanjorski was referencing. The week of September 11, 2008, we had a mass attack on our financial system, and when that happened, as a result, the net worth of every American has declined significantly. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which has been as high as 14,100 in October 2007, fell as low as 6,500 by March of 2009. That was the second phase economic attack. So how did we get here? How did we, we reach this point? It's like the movie Megamind, where you see the character falling through the sky, wondering, how in the world did I get to this point? So I'm going to take you back in time a little bit, back, if you can remember, all the way back to the turn of the millennium or the turn of the century. Can you remember all the way back to the year 2000? Well, this is from Time Magazine, the commemorative issue. Here's a few reminders of how much has changed from 2000 to present. Believe it or not, Jan in December 28, 2000, the Office of Management and Budget predicted that we would have all federal debt paid off by the year 2010. Now, it seems like 2000 was a long time ago. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was in the 12,000 range. Well, actually, not much has changed since then, mostly because of the market crash. But the price of oil was under $20 a barrel. Some things have changed significantly. At the turn of the century, in fact, in 1999, two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army were tasked with one task, 
How Can We Beat a Superpower? And the title of their book roughly translates to Unrestricted Warfare. It was published by PLA Press in 1999. What they found, and this is a quote that's attributed to John Adams uh, about two ways to in conquer and enslave a nation. One is by the sword and the other is by debt. Now, I don't know that John Adams actually said this, but it's attributed to him, and I'll use it because it makes a strong point. The Chinese knew something that they knew that we, they could not confront our military personnel to personnel, tank to tank, missile to missile. They had seen what we had done just a few years earlier in the first Gulf War. They had understood that we would moved out Saddam Hussein's uh, army, which was the fourth largest standing army on the planet, and we pushed him out in a matter of days from Kuwait. And they said in their book, Unrestricted Warfare, there's no way to match the U.S. militarily. We'll have to take other tactics. And their other tactics included some of the things I'll be talking about. Here's a copy of the book, Unrestricted Warfare, and you'll notice on the cover the Twin Towers. The reason that the Twin Towers are on the cover of a book published originally in China in 1999 is they actually mention Osama bin Laden by name, they mention the World Trade Center, and they mention that as a soft, vulnerable target in the United States, an economic target. And I bring that up because they mentioned it two years before it happened. What's happened since the turn of the century? For one thing, we were on a path to paying off our debt, as I mentioned earlier. And you can look at the chart, and you can see the blue, bar the blue bars represent uh, surpluses in the economy. What happened? You'll notice that after September 11, 2001, we began to show an ever-increasing uh, debt process. And after 2008, we've, we began running trillion-dollar deficits. And that's the economic hole that we're in. And as a result, while our economy as a portion of the world economy has decreased sharply, the Chinese economy has increased sharply. There have been winners and there have been losers since the turn of the century, and the Chinese have clearly been winners. The other winner are the OPEC nations. OPEC oil uh, revenues have rocketed in the past 10 years, and you can see that uh, they were bumping along in the $200 billion range at the turn of the century. Now we're talking trillion dollars every year of oil revenues. And as a result, the Chinese have built up $3.1 trillion of excess reserves in their economy. They had $100 billion, and the Middle East has built up about $3 trillion in sovereign wealth fund monies. So my question and the topic of the book, Secret Weapon, is are we engaged in an economic war? If you believe that, you'll have to accept three assumptions. First, we have enemies of the United States. And I, I, I believe that that's certainly true. Those enemies find that a direct confrontation, at least at this time, is not desirable. They don't want to fight a shooting war with us. And the third thing is we have vulnerabilities in our system. And I think all three of those are true. So the book, Unrestricted Warfare, and this is the Chinese language cover, it says, when people revised the history books in the early 21st century, the section on financial warfare will get the reader's utmost attention. And then they go on and say they're not going to be learning from a military strategist or a statesman. The centerpiece of this will be the tactics of George Soros. They go on and say a single stock market crash or some way to manipulate a currency of your enemy uh, or, or um, something along those lines financially, that's a new concept weapon. That's a new way to attack a nation. And that's the, that was the lesson of unrestricted warfare. They go on and say, if the attacking side musters a large amount of capital, launches a sneak attack against financial markets, then buries computer viruses while carrying out network attacks, they can cause the enemy nation to fall into social panic, street riots, and a political crisis. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Chinese have done all of these things. I'm suggesting they wrote a doctrine in 1999 that these things could be used against the United States, and I believe we've seen some of them already take place. And as recently as February of 2011, the official journal of the Communist Party came out and said China's greatest weapons that they have are economic weapons. They essentially endorsed the unrestricted warfare doctrine. So, who read the book? Well, one person we believe read it was Osama bin Laden. We believe it for a couple of reasons. One is he, he pretty nearly quotes it, 
But secondly, he's mentioned some 30 times in this book, and he was an egomaniac. He looked at everything that was said about him or mentioned about him, and so we believe he wrote it. And what he said was, their number one target of Al-Qaeda was to hit the American economy through all possible means. And I believe that they used that September 11th, 2001, was a direct attack on our economy. The planes flown into the World Trade Center were not intended to kill the largest number of, of create the largest number of casualties. They were intended to hit our economy. So why would he be so anti-American economy? Well, one of the reasons is he's a great, he was a great believer in Sharia law, and he wanted to see that implemented around the world. He believed very firmly in his faith, and it turns out that the great Sharia scholars believe that Sharia and capitalism are completely incompatible. And so we've seen uh, Sharia compliant finance, actually the experts come out and say we're opposed to capitalism and they list these reasons. They don't like the American way of life. We also know that enemies know how to attack our markets. Following the unrestricted warfare playbook, the Russians approached the Chinese in the year 2008 at the Summer Olympics and asked, would you join us in a financial attack on the United States? We'll dump our holdings of American bonds. Will you join us and dump your holdings? Well, apparently the Chinese said no, they didn't dump their holdings. But the Russians apparently said yes, and they did. We know this because Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, put this in his memoirs titled On the Brink. So, in 2008, end of 2008, I presented a white paper that went to the Pentagon I was contacted in early 2009 and contracted to do a study, which I performed for the Irregular Warfare Support Group that was presented in July of 2009. I'm going to be sharing some of the facts from that study in this paper, and I covered it in detail in the book Secret Weapon. The study identified specific secret weapons that could be used. Two of the weapons, and those will be the two I'll concentrate here, were naked short selling and credit default swaps. Most people have never heard of either of these, and yet these two items, secret weapons, very nearly sealed our fate in 2008 and 2009 and caused that economic turmoil and the collapse that we're talking about. George Soros as much as acknowledged this in a March 2009 editorial for the Wall Street Journal titled One Way to Stop Bear Raids, in which he said, it's clear that AIG, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers were destroyed by a combination of credit default swaps and unlimited short selling, which is possible through naked short selling, that mutually uh, reinforce each other. It's the weapons used in combination that virtually destroyed our economy. So most people don't know what naked short selling is. It is not sitting at your E-Trade account in your underwear selling stocks. What naked short selling is, it's the evil twin brother of traditional short selling. And to explain naked short selling, I'll have to give you a moment and explain what short selling is. It is possible to go to your broker and say, I believe that XYZ company, let's use Apple as an example. Apple computer, I, you might think, is too expensive at $600 a share or, or wherever it might be. And you say, I want to sell it short and I want to make a profit if it goes down. The broker will then seek to borrow shares for you from any of their clients that would loan the shares, and they would loan you those shares. You would sell them on, on the market, and if the price of Apple went from $600 to $500 and you sold a share at $600, you would buy it back at $500. You would take the $600 that you sold it for, buy it back at $500, and have a $100 profit. That's short selling. It's completely legitimate. It's legal. It's acceptable. You borrow shares. You sell them. If it goes down, you make a profit. If it goes up, you lose money. It's taking a risk just like buying long, which is traditional buying a stock. That's short selling. It's legal. It's legitimate. Naked short selling is different. Naked short selling is essentially selling shares that you don't own and have not borrowed. Now, the average person can't do that. But large financial firms in 2008 were doing it, and most of this short selling was coming out of Dubai and out of London, mostly from the Middle East. People were selling shares of Lehman Brothers. They didn't own the stock. They didn't borrow the stock. It is tantamount to writing up a fake stock certificate and then selling it. So Rolling Stone did a review of this, and it's called Wall Street's Naked Swindle, 
and naked short sellers were selling, dumping large quantities of stock that they didn't own, flooding the market with counterfeit shares, depressing the company's share price by making the shares less scarce and therefore less valuable. On September 10th, there were 5,877,649 failed trades. That means people had sold shares but didn't deliver them, naked short selling. The next day, September 11th, the seventh anniversary of the September 11th attack on the United States homeland. On September 11th, 2008, there were 22,625,000 trade, failed trades. The next day, there were 32,877,000. Then on September 15th, the price of Lehman Brothers stock fell to 21 cents a share. That's what Representative Kanjorski, Democrat from Pennsylvania, on the YouTube was talking about. It was a mass panic. It nearly destroyed our financial system, and it led to the TARP, the bailouts, the stimulus. All of the issues that we've had since then came as a result of this attack on Lehman Brothers. And my sources are as diverse as our Democrat representative from Pennsylvania, Rolling Stone magazine, and George Soros himself in the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Susan Trimbath on Bloomberg said that Lehman Brothers, the reason that it failed, between 30 and 70 percent of its decline came from counterfeit naked short sales placed on the market. So who did these? Where did they come from? Well, the economist said it came from exactly naked short selling, too big a fail count. And they mentioned my report on economic warfare. And you can see the blip up in the market in September 2008. Failed to deliver trades means somebody sold something they didn't own, didn't borrow, they just sold it. It was counterfeit. So the Securities Exchange Commission did a study. And the inspector general for the SEC is a man named David Kotz. And David Kotz put out the report which talked about naked short selling. And he said, essentially, there were 5,000 complaints of naked short selling, and the SEC took zero actions. Trading and markets recognize that abusive naked short selling can have a negative effect on the market as fraudsters may use naked short selling to engage in illegal stock manipulation by selling stock short and failing to deliver the shares at the time of settlement with the purpose of driving down the stock price. Now, who did this? Well, the SEC, in the middle of the financial crisis, banned all short selling on financial stocks. And when they did that, Wall Street wondered why. A man named Barry Ritholtz, who writes the Big Picture blog, he's highly respected, put out a blog on September, it was uh, September 15th, I believe, he said, what seemed like a wild theory yesterday seems a whole lot less wild today. The bear raids that we were talking about on the banks and the brokers were not a case of just U.S. hedge funds piling on. In other words, people trying to make money from the decline of these shares. The lion's share of the shorting was done from London and Dubai. The huge increase in shorting occurred on 9-11-2008, the seventh anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And on top of that, the same institutions that were being sold short, Lehman Brothers, AIG, et cetera, were the ones that were suffering in recent days. The ones sold short on September 11, 2008 were the same ones attacked on September 11, 2001 with offices in the World Trade Center. So we asked the question, is anyone investigating whether or not this is a case of financial terrorism? Then he said, if you want to find the problem, is if you want to know who's to blame for the past five years of naked short selling, you look at the financial brokers themselves and the nonfeasance of effectless SEC, which is the same message the inspector general of the SEC said. We were, in other words, caught with our pants down. The U.S. government was not enforcing the naked short selling rules and laws, and this was a loophole that was exploited potentially by terrorists, mostly coming from Sharia compliant areas with Sharia compliant funds in the Middle East. That's one secret weapon that I identified in the book. A second secret weapon is credit default swaps. More recently than what I'm going to share with you, 
J.P. Morgan Chase announced that they had lost, at first they said $2 billion, now it may be $4 billion because they were playing with credit default swaps, supposedly hedging their book of business. And so Mr. Diamond was called to Congress while I was in Washington recently to testify as to what, what had actually happened. Most people don't even know what a credit default swap is. But a commentator on CNBC said, and used this term, he said, are we ever going to tell the American people that it's essentially like buying fire insurance on a property you don't own? I go a step further. It's like buying fire insurance on a property you don't own and then buying matches. Credit default swaps are insurance policies. And they're insurance against default. So if you've borrowed money, taken out credit, and someone wants to ensure that you're going to pay that credit back, they will buy an insurance policy called a credit default swap. Here's the problem. You can buy credit default swaps on companies you've not loaned money to. So recently, Greece has had a problem because their credit default swap insurance rates have gone through the roof. Everybody wanted to buy insurance in case Greece was going to default. That creates a bad incentive in the marketplace. It creates an incentive if you're a holder of that insurance, you hope Greece does default. And so it creates opportunities. In 2008, what happened is, according to George Soros, everybody was buying credit default swaps on Lehman Brothers, hoping they would default. The difficulty is, is that if you buy a lot of insurance that they won't default, their ability to borrow money goes down, and that squeezes them. And that's what happened to Lehman Brothers. And what happened to Lehman Brothers almost led to the collapse of our financial system. I'm not saying this, George Soros said it in the op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. So credit default swaps, you can see from the chart, credit default swap rates spiked two different times. The first time was with Bear Stearns' failure, and you'll see that in the February-March period of 2008, and then they spiked a second time in the September 11th period of 2008 with Lehman Brothers. So here's what happened to Lehman Brothers, keeping in mind what Kanjorski said. When Lehman Brothers failed, the entire system imploded. On the week of 9-11-2008, naked short interest increased 1,600-fold on Lehman Brothers. Credit default swap rates skyrocketed. That weekend, Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, called into his offices for one of those fateful meetings and asked, who's going to bail out Merrill Lynch? And they looked at Bank of America and said, Bank of America, you're going to buy Merrill Lynch, right? And Bank of America said, yes, sir, we're going to. They then looked at uh, Lehman Brothers and said, who's going to be, buy Lehman Brothers? And the answer that came back was Barclays Bank. Barclays was going to buy Lehman Brothers. They talked about it going in. When the weekend ended, they chose not to. Now, according to the Treasury sector, Secretary, the reason they chose not to is the British government didn't want to backstop all the debt and the problems. It's not what the British government said. What the British government said was slightly different. What they said was the shareholders did not want to do the transaction. And according to British law, it required a shareholder vote. Well, who were the primary shareholders? Two sovereign wealth funds from the Middle East that are Sharia compliant. They had the right to have 53% voting shares. Those two sovereign wealth funds rejected the purchase of Lehman Brothers. The net result is we had the financial panic and collapse that, that uh, we've talked about, the global stock markets collapsed, but Barclays did go buy Lehman Brothers out of bankruptcy. They bought the assets. And in December of 2008, their auditors came to them and said, these assets are worth maybe four or five times what you paid for them. You have to mark them up on the books. And then in early 2009, those two sovereign wealth funds took a combined $5 billion of capital out of Barclays. The net result of it is a massive wealth transfer and the entire global system nearly collapsed. Now, I cover all of this in the book, including the specific trading data, who was behind the naked short selling, where it happened, and so forth. George Soros himself said, on September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers was allowed to go into bankruptcy because Barclays didn't buy them. The entire financial system suffered what amounted to a cardiac arrest and had to be put on life support. 
the effect on the global economy was the equivalent of the collapse of the banking system during the Great Depression. So, in my report for the Pentagon, I identified the motive, the means, and the opportunity. Who had the motive? Who had the means? Who had the opportunity? And we've looked across the board, those who had economic motives to see harm, those who had non-economic motives, those who wanted to commit financial jihad, those who had a long-term view and thought they could survive and, and win through this, enemies of capitalism, and then a variety of unholy alliances. And by unholy alliances, I'm referencing people that you wouldn't necessarily think that would work together, godless communists and, and uh, Islamic extremists. And we looked at all of those. And we came out with a list of suspects. And the list is the traditional enemies of the United States. It could be uh, potential enemies like Russia and China. It could be real and actual enemies, stated enemies like Iran, uh, Venezuela, and others who stand against, uh, against our system. And, and it, uh, there is a massive uh, radical Islam element connected to this. Some of the great Sharia scholars have made extraordinary anti-American radical Islamic statements. In fact, in August of 2007, right as the market was peaking, one of those Sharia experts was posed this dilemma. How can your Islamic Sharia compliant fund sell short banks like Lehman Brothers? And there was a ruling from a Sharia scholar called an Arbun, Islamic down payment structure, that allowed them to not violate Islamic law, but achieve the effect of short selling. And they did it without borrowing shares, which sounds an awful lot like the naked short selling that I've been talking about. Those are secret weapons. Now, since then, we've seen some incredible things happen in the market. One thing is uh, um, uh, Sergei Alinikov walks out of Goldman Sachs with a flash drive that has 32 megabytes of trading data on it. Why is that significant? Well, the, the trading algorithms that were on that flash drive determine how Goldman Sachs buys and sells using high frequency trading. High frequency trading accounts for maybe three quarters of all trading volume on the stock exchange. So if someone stole Goldman Sachs trading codes and then intended to abuse them and misuse them, they would have a secret weapon that they could use to bring down our financial system. Why is that significant? Well, we know that NASDAQ has been hacked. And the NSA was brought in to look at it. And this, presumably, the reason the NSA was there is because it was either a very capable criminal organization or it was a state-sponsored attack. What's the risk? The risk is that intruders could alter trading algorithms and cause a market crash. And in fact, on May 6, 2010, the Dow dropped nearly 1,000 points with the bulk of the drop happening in about six minutes' time. They call it the flash crash. It panicked a lot of people. Nobody knows the origins of it. The SEC did a thorough investigation, and they believe it may be tied to trading algorithms in a firm out of Kansas City which presumably has less security in protecting their trading algorithms than a Goldman Sachs might. Perhaps someone stole their trading algorithms, altered them in some way, hacked the system. All of this is to suggest that the new form of warfare is exactly what the Chinese said. They said, as we see it, a single man-made stock market crash fits in as a new concept weapon. So that's part of what I've been studying, and the reason that I titled the book Secret Weapon is I go through in detail and explain in English, in understandable terms, how, what these secret weapons are, who could be using them, who has the motive, who has the means, the opportunity, and how we can protect our nation against it. We had another flash crash that happened. March 23, 2012, Apple computer itself dropped $52 billion in market cap in a single trade. It was a mini flash crash. It was done off the New York Stock Exchange by a trading system known as BATS. At the same time BATS was going public, better alternative trading system, BATS, was going public, and they had to pull their public offering because it was so embarrassing that Apple had dropped and other companies had dropped so sharply. It's just evidence 
that when things go wrong haywire with the computers, that the markets can suffer as a result. There are risks in the system, and as recently as March 2012, that was demonstrated to us. Now, a question, if somebody had hacked into their system, could they cause this to happen? The answer is absolutely yes. Even in line with that, a lot of people know about the problems that we're seeing in Europe. Just as an example of how people can manipulate the economies, again, George Soros in the Wall Street Journal is mentioned because in early 2010, he brought together a group of hedge funds and said, where are we going to attack? And they had an ideas dinner. And at the ideas dinner, they discussed Greece being vulnerable. And so the heavyweight hedge funds came together, including George Soros's fund, and they talked about using derivatives like credit default swaps and other means to attack the economy of Greece. Is there any wonder why the Germans in May of 2010, shortly thereafter, decided they wanted to ban the secret weapons that I'm talking about, naked short selling and credit default swaps? And interestingly, when they did ban these, the euro actually stabilized. The euro on that date was was um, uh, 1.2385, $1.24 US dollars would buy a euro. And the euro actually has stabilized since then, despite the situation in Greece and throughout Europe getting substantially worse. I attribute part of that to the fact that they acknowledged that there were secret weapons and they responded accordingly. In fact, German spy agencies, Greek spy agencies, and others have all indicated that there was an attack financial terror attack on Europe, and we're seeing it play out now. One more thing on that. When Osama bin Laden was killed by the SEAL team, according to German press reports, on his person was a strategy concept for destroying the economies of Europe, and what I understand, it was built around the unrestricted warfare methodology. It was the same kind of thing that George Soros talked about is talked about here using those style techniques. So if those are weapons of mass destruction, and Warren Buffett called credit default swaps financial weapons of mass destruction, and, and they could be used by the enemies of the United States or the enemies of Europe, that becomes a national security issue and risk. Now, Vladimir Putin in Russia has his favorite professor his favorite professor has said very publicly that the United States could break into five different countries, a collapse of the United States. Putin believes this man. What's going to have that cause that to happen? He says the cause of that will be an economic collapse. He said the U.S. foreign debt's a pyramid scheme. China and Russia should work together to usurp Washington's role as global financial regulator and Russia and China would emerge from the economic turmoil stronger, and the two nations should work together to create an alternative to replace the U.S. dollar. Remember what I told you earlier was that um, in 2008, the Russians approached the Chinese and said, let's dump our Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac holdings, and as a result from that, we could bankrupt the United States. So the Pentagon did a war game. They titled it Unrestricted Warfare, based on the Chinese book. And in the war game, the net result of it is the Russians and Chinese work together, and they destroy the value of the American dollar. We've already talked about the two phases. Phase one was the oil price ramp up, which benefited the Russians, by the way, with higher oil prices. Phase two, and the Middle East. Phase two of the attack was the attack on the stock market that we've talked about in length. This is phase three. And according to the war game, the war begins when the Russians stop taking U.S. dollars in exchange for oil. The U.S. dollar is called the reserve currency of the world. The reason it's the reserve currency of the world is if anybody has extra money, any nation has extra money, they generally tend to buy U.S. Treasury bonds and they, they denominate their excess, dollars, excess money in U.S. dollars. Oil is traded in U.S. dollars, which is what's the enforcer mechanism if you want to buy energy, you have to buy it in dollars, and it's been historically true until recently when the Iranians started accepting alternative currencies. According to the war game, the war, World War III, 
begins with a press release, and this is an economic war. The Russian government says we will stop taking dollars for oil, and the goal to drive down the value of the U.S. dollar by 75 percent. These were the findings of the war game. Why are we vulnerable? We're vulnerable from a massive federal debt. And you can see in the chart, remember I said that in the year 2000, we were on track to having all of our debt paid off by 2010, and then 9-11 happened. It was an attack on the economy. Then the 2008 collapse happened. That was also an attack on the economy. The net result is we have had a massive federal response and our debt has grown out of hand. This debt has become a national security issue. And it's exactly as bin Laden said. What we can do if we hit their economy, he made it clear, if we hit the American economy, they'll get so worried about economic things that they'll stop defending the homeland. They'll cut defense spending. They'll do all these things. We are playing into bin Laden's hands. If, as he burns in hell, if it's possible, he's smiling because he believes that he has, has launched a successful attack. Zawahiri called on the Islamic public sell your dollars and buy gold. Get out of the dollar because that's the next phase and the next level of attack. He predicted a complete collapse in the infidels economy. So we've seen some unusual things happen beyond there. In early 2012, Italian authorities seized six trillion dollars worth of fake treasury bonds going from Italy into Switzerland. Six trillion. If you printed a billion dollars bond on pieces of paper, it would take a box, a ream, a, a, a box full of paper, a carton full of paper, uh, all, 10 reams, and you'd have to have an, an additional two reams because there requires 6,000 bonds with a billion dollar denomination to get to six trillion. Now, who would bother to do this? These were not novelties to be sold at, at uh, Spencer's Gifts in the shopping malls. These were intended as an economic warfare attack. They were intended to go to a dozen different Swiss banks to be held in uh, safety deposit boxes. At the point when the dollar was under attack, they would be brought out and dumped on the market in confusion. That was the purpose behind these. Who believed that the dollar was going to be under attack? The people behind this believe that there is a coming phase three attack. The Gulf Petropowers have created an alternative currency to replace the dollar. Even uh, the uh, head of Gulf Bahrain's Gulf One Investment Bank said the dollar's failed. We've got to get rid of it. The defense minister in Iran has said we have secret weapons. Read the quote. We've not revealed all of our capabilities. And I, I think it's interesting. He uses the term, we have secret weapons. And I know my book has been downloaded. You can see where it's been downloaded. My website's been accessed in Tehran on a repeated basis. They are interested in secret weapons. They said, we've not revealed all our capabilities. We're not going to sit still and observe threats from fragile materialistic powers, referring to the United States, being eaten by worms from the inside, Ayatollah uh, Khamenei told students at the military college, Iran will respond with full force to any aggressors or even threats in a way that will demolish the aggressors from within. They've made it quite plain that they're willing to attack us economically. And we're in an economic war with Iran right now. We've cut them off to the international banking system. We have uh, lev uh, used sanctions against them, and they have responded with attempts to break the dollar and to hurt us economically. So. Back to what I shared from Unrestricted Warfare, and this is the Chinese uh, cover. How do you beat a superior enemy? You amass a great deal of capital. The Chinese have done this. They've gone from $100 billion in foreign currency reserves to $3.1 trillion. The Middle East, the Sharia funds, the sovereign wealth funds have gone from virtually no money to $3 trillion in the past decade or so. Then you launch a sneak attack on financial markets. And we outlined exactly how that took place, and I mentioned a little bit in, in this briefing, using secret weapons like naked short selling and credit default swaps. And it nearly destroyed our economy. Then, after you cause a financial crisis, you bury a computer virus and a hacker detachment. And it even talks about specifically hacking the electric power grid, being prepared to use EMPs. It talks about hacking uh, water projects. The idea is you cause, cre create mass panic. We know that Russia, 
China and others have hacked our systems. That's acknowledged in the press on a regular basis. And the fourth thing is you cause the enemy nation to fall into social panic, street riots, and a political crisis. Interestingly enough, Mr. Soros has said that he believes that there will be a violent Occupy response soon. He says Occupy to turn violent this summer. Now, this study and all the details, and it was a 110 page study with 200 footnotes. This is a 250 page book or so. Uh, this plus an additional uh, stacks of additional data, market participant trading reports, all of the inside baseball things from, the Wall, from Wall Street. I've turned over to uh, CIA, uh, DIA, SEC, DOD, sitting senators, FBI, two past attorney generals, and I've done 200 meetings. You've just gotten a very brief version of some of those meetings. Included among those are people like uh, former Director of Central Intelligence, uh, Jim Woolsey, who's been a great supporter, and he wrote a nice cover, cover note on the book. It said, along with our, the Internet, our markets, banks, and other financial systems are vital institutions that are far more vulnerable to complete disruption than we would hope, especially to carefully planned interveners with the opportunity, motive, and means to say, bring down the dollar. Freeman, referring to my report, explains persuasively and clearly why we may be beginning the third act of a monetary and fiscal strategy. You don't care about dark pools, huge Middle East sovereign wealth funds, naked short selling and bear runs. I'm afraid you will, and rather soon. Former Attorney General Ed Meeks. Uh, Kevin Freeman has written a fascinating book which raises serious questions about the economic security of our country. This important work expands on the briefings on economic terrorism that I received from the author and provides the material for further investigation of the subject. Frank Gaffney. Frank said some nice things where he said, Kevin Freeman is preeminent among the handful of Americans who appreciate the important nexus between finance and national security. His path-breaking research reveals that, unfortunately, our enemies understand this nexus all too well and are exploiting our national ignorance and vulnerabilities in this ar arena to inflict grave damage on our economy and the common defense. And he makes a great point here. What he's saying is the average American doesn't know what naked short selling or credit default swaps are. I can guarantee you that there are some highly educated uh, jihadists who do understand these. And we can actually, we actually can trace those who have downloaded complete explanations on these topics throughout the Middle East, and you can trace their computer domains. Fred Grandy, uh, also a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy. When most of us think of acts of terrorism, we imagine car bombs or hijacked airliners. Kevin Freeman compels us to think again. He explores the dimly understood world of financial terrorism that ultimately underwrites the steady progress of jihad against America and its allies. If you want to know what our enemies have already figured out, read this book. Even Kevin Hassett, who, was the, uh, who is currently the Director of Economic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and was the former senior economist at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. I spent a lot of time going through all the data with Kevin, uh, Dr. Hassett, and he said, when Kevin Freeman, after an impressive career in finance, began investigating the possibility that terrorists are manipulating our markets, he suddenly found himself in a real-world spy novel. There is so much smoke surrounding his study of economic warfare that the only question is not whether there is a fire, but how far the fire has spread. The Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission looked in detail to find out what caused the financial crisis. They didn't mention financial terrorism despite the months of hearings, despite the thickness of their book. In fact, the dissenters said the commission majority report ignored hypotheses about the causes of the financial crisis that any objective investigator would have considered while focusing solely on theories that have political currency. In other words, the intelligence of our nation on the financial crisis became highly politicized in order to achieve a political objective rather than look out for the interests of the American people. Sadly, that's the same politicization process that has taken place in the national defense arena and in our intelligence itself. So, on the cover of the Washington Times, March 1, 2011, front page article, Financial Terrorism Suspected in Crash. I've been on CNBC with this. 
Glenn Beck has talked about it. It's been on Fox News. I've done multiple radio interviews. I appreciate you taking time to get a glimpse into the issue of economic warfare and financial terrorism, to understand the risks that our nation is facing. If you'd like to learn more, you can get more from the Center for Security Policy or from my website, secretweapon.org.